Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is an industry update, why Rockefeller, First Republic, and other boutique firms are attracting so many top advisors. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. This is the third in a three-part series on the landscape of the wealth management industry. In the first part, I described the landscape as a continuum, a horizontal line where options range from the biggest banks and wirehouses all the way to a fee-only RIA with many models and options in between. In part two of this series, we took a deep dive into the wirehouses and regional firms, that is the captive employee model specifically. And today in part three, I'm going to explore boutique firms, a version of quasi-independence that has become very popular, especially amongst the top of the food chain folks. Mind you, These are not the legendary boutique firms of the past, firms like Lehman, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, and Bear Stearns. Today's boutique firms are the new and improved 2.0 version, a quasi-independent-like model where advisors have the control and freedom that comes with independence but work under a W-2 construct. These firms offer aggressive recruiting deals and, in some cases, a mix of cash and equity. They offer third-party custody with an institutional custodian like Schwab, Fidelity, or BNY Pershing. They offer access to a unique and amplified set of investment solutions and cutting-edge technology. They have strong balance sheets and are led by industry stalwarts who in many cases came from the wirehouse world. In a nutshell, they allow an advisor who is intrigued by independence but doesn't want to deal with the hassle of building a business and managing the middle and back office to be part of a community of talented and like-minded folks. Said another way, boutique models allow advisors to replicate everything from the traditional brokerage model in terms of what they are currently offering to their clients. And the less restrictive, more creative and entrepreneurial environment ultimately allows for a superior service model. Today's boutique firms, like Rockefeller Capital Management, First Republic Wealth Management, William Blair, and Steward Partners, to name a few, were tailor-made for the modernist, an advisor who is intrigued by aspects of business ownership, but for whom independence would be a bridge too far. Probably the best but most unsexy descriptor for these boutique firms is quasi-independence. These firms have had extraordinary success in recruiting top advisors in the last few years because they filled a gap in the industry landscape that was left by the demise of yesterday's boutique firms. Some of the industry's most entrepreneurial and visionary leaders capitalized on this gap and filled it with exactly what top advisors were looking for. Let's look at the two most popular boutique firms, Rockefeller Capital Management, and First Republic Investment Management. Just this week, First Republic announced the recruitment of Phil Scott in Bellevue, Washington, an $18 million team managing $2.7 billion in assets coming from Merrill Lynch PBIG, their private bank and investment group. And Phil was a lifer there, 35 years to be exact, and his 11-person team. In the past 18 months alone, First Republic has recruited 15 teams managing just shy of $24 billion in assets. In that same time period, Rockefeller recruited 27 teams managing approximately $18 billion in assets. In June of this year, 
Rockefeller opened, by way of example, a Paramus, New Jersey office for a team doing $6 million in production on $750 million in assets. And that was by a 40-year Merrill veteran, Doug Linker and Noel Hodges. And on that same day in June, they recruited another team of Merrill lifers in San Fran, led by Ann Wang and her five-person team, and they were producing about $3 million on $275 million in assets. So what is it about these firms that would attract superstar advisor talent? Let's start with First Republic. First Republic first crossed my path some 15 years ago. While on paper, the story sounded like a decent one at the time, it never really got much traction and not much of my attention either. It was considered just another bank brokerage option, albeit one with a clean and solid reputation. But fast forward to 2010, when the bank tasked Bob Thornton, an ex-Goldman executive, to shake things up and transform the First Republic Wealth Management Unit into a major player. The first thing Bob did was to philosophically double down and to acquire the iconic Los Angeles-based Luminous Capital for more than $100 million. Luminous was a $6 billion RIA, and actually the founders were a Merrill breakaway themselves. Their names were Mark Sear and David Ho, and in fact, in September or October of this year, I'm going to be interviewing Mark and David, so it's a story you'll want to tune into. First Republic then followed that acquisition up with a second RIA acquisition of the bi-coastal $6.1 billion Constellation Wealth Advisors. But these two mega deals put First Republic on the map, and most importantly, on the radar of top advisor talent. What's followed is nothing short of extraordinary. They've been slowly but surely recruiting cream of the crop, multi-billion dollar top teams in each of their markets. Mind you, they have limited geography. They're only in about 12 or 15 locations, but the advisors are coming from every major firm on the street, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan, UBS, and Merrill. So what's the big attraction? Well, for one, it's a 33-year-old firm with pristine reputation for serving the needs of high net worth and ultra high net worth clients. Secondly, it's a firm that's structured as a corporate RIA and is actually the largest in the country, today managing about $160 billion in assets. Thirdly, it's an entrepreneurial culture. What's seen by a lot of advisors as the perfect middle ground option between full-on independence and working for a traditional big brokerage firm. Four, it's got very strong lending capabilities, capabilities that are really hard to beat. Fifth, a very real referral mechanism from the bank. And this is the part, it is this number five, the real referral mechanism from the bank that is the game changer. So admittedly, advisors are always skeptical of it because the bank brokerage models of yesteryear were ones that promised referrals from the bank but never really delivered. But the First Republic model absolutely delivers. We've moved several very significant teams to First Republic in the last number of years, and they've all either doubled or are on the way to tripling their asset base since they joined in a year, two, three years because of that referral mechanism. And sixth, finally, they're paying very competitive transition deals, but they're creative, they're entrepreneurial, and they're customized. Okay, so how about Rockefeller Capital Management? Rockefeller came on the scene in March of 2018 when Greg Fleming, ex-Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch President of Wealth Management, bought the iconic Rockefeller Global family office in partnership with private equity firm Viking Global to build a modern, nimble, multifamily office on its existing chassis. From the get-go, even before Greg and his rock star leadership team had finished building out the infrastructure, Rockefeller began attracting the industry's advisor elite. It seemed as though it was exactly the model that many of these folks were waiting for, 
an opportunity to be more independent than they were at their brokerage firms, but not as independent as business ownership would require. Plus, these advisors wanted a name brand that had sex appeal and to be paid a competitive and aggressive transition package that allowed them to make up for the deferred comp they'd walk away from while also giving them plenty of upside. Rockefeller offers private wealth and private banking capabilities all under one roof and access to a more sophisticated and curated solution set for the ultra affluent market. The firm offers a bespoke experience that can meet and exceed any client's needs, the prospect of which is impossible to achieve within the confines of a big brokerage firm. Chris Dupuis, in fact, who is an ex-Merrill senior leader, now the COO of Rockefeller, describes the firm as an advisor and client-centric culture that really allows sophisticated, experienced advisors to get back to their roots, to think like entrepreneurs, and wake up every morning enthusiastic about coming up with customized strategies for their very best clients. And perhaps one of the most appealing things about Rockefeller is the full suite of family office and concierge services it offers. And these are things like bill pay and client accounting, tax planning and prep, insurance planning, in-house trust capabilities, customized financial planning and cash flow analysis, and access to private investments and a unique array of alternative investments. In a lot of ways, these firms, meaning First Republic and Rockefeller, almost sound too good to be true. So what's the hitch? Well, for one, as I mentioned, they both have limited geographical footprints. Rockefeller, more than First Republic, might be willing to consider opening in some secondary cities where they may not currently have a presence, but they are highly selective. And First Republic is really married to their existing footprint to only opening wealth management offices in cities where they also have a bank presence. Secondly, both firms are highly selective about who gets to join their clubs. And thirdly, they're not quite right for an advisor who has a high level of entrepreneurial DNA, meaning they are boutique firms and they certainly offer an advisor more freedom and a more entrepreneurial culture than say a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley or a UBS might. But an advisor that's looking to build their own brand or to build their own legacy or to own 100% of the equity, these models will not be right for them. But what does all this really mean? It means that the waterfall of legitimate opportunities has expanded greatly and is no longer a binary choice between staying put and making what most perceive to be a lateral move to another major firm. That contrasts to what it was years ago. Before models like First Republic and Rockefeller came on the scene and independence was as mainstream an option as it is today, If an advisor was dissatisfied with their current firm, the choice was to either go to another major firm or to just accept the imperfections and stay put. And today that choice is much less binary than that, much more robust, and much more exciting. It also means that we will continue to see more of these quasi-independent or boutique models being born because it's what advisors want. And where leaders from the wirehouse world who want in on the breakaway trend can really make their marks. Thirdly, it's a choice that's good for the industry at large and clients specifically, because it means that clients are more likely to get access to best in class capabilities and service without limitation. Fourth, it's proof that advisor mindset has really shifted. While firms like Rockefeller and First Republic are offering top recruiting deals, still, they represent the notion that advisors value freedom and control more than anything. Ultimately, what it really means is that it's an exciting time to be an advisor with more options and a greater likelihood that most anyone can find their own version of utopia. So, 
Until our next episode, I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908 879-1002 or by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to AdvisorHub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.